as Sharon mentioned briefly, uh, my topic for our short learning session this evening is called the creative impulse in early Hasidism. And I want to focus on one Hasidic master and one teaching from that one Hasidic master. So this is just a taste, if you will, of the many possible interpretive dimensions of Hasidism. But before I go any further, just so that we're starting on the same footing, I want to just say that Hasidism, as several of you probably know, was and continues to be a great mystical revival movement, a popular revival movement that started in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, and the first great personality, whether or not he intended to create a movement, is for another conversation, but the first great personality who serves as the root, if you will, of the Hasidic movement was Rabbi Israel ben Eliezer, right, otherwise known as the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, who was what we might call a practical Kabbalist. That is a mystical master that was an adept in the use of divine names, of amulets, of herbs, a whole variety of different techniques for healing of mind and body. And the thinker that we're going to explore briefly is the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, whose name was Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ephraim of Sadulkov. And one of the interesting things about Rabbi Moshe Chaim Ephraim is that he was a much more introverted spiritual leader than his grandfather or his brother, Reb Baruch, who became in some ways the model for the court Hasidic master. Unlike those two individuals, this Rebbe, this spiritual master, oftentimes simply called the Degel, <laughs> because that was the name of his book, Degel Machane Ephraim, a play on his name Ephraim, and a quotation from the Torah. He um, was known as a more retiring, scholarly, educator, and pastoral presence. He began his career outside of his grandfather's hometown, Mezebij, but returned there to live there. So he spent the last 15 years in Mezebij, where he believed that part of his mission was to take up the legacy in his own particular way of his grandfather, while his brother established a court. Their nephew, as some of you may know, was the famous Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. So we're dealing here with a person who in Hasidic parlance we would describe as an individual with great yichas, right, with great family lineage. And um, his book, the Degel Machane Ephraim, is considered a classic now within Hasidism. It's been reprinted more than a dozen times since it first appeared in 1811, and it's quoted many, many times by later masters and by Hasidic lay people and scholars of Hasidism and Jewish mysticism because it is a very uh, clarion articulation of some of the fundamental ideas of this mystical revival movement as it was taking shape. And there are many quotations that the Degel offers in the name of his grandfather, which is considered to be a prize, a treasure, because the Baal Shem Tov was an oral teacher. And in fact, was quite strict with his students about recording and disseminating his teachings. So this is one of the key sources for what we might call Torah Tabesht, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. And this master's interpretation, as you'll see, I think is quite beautiful. Uh, he's a quite a learned person who was trying in a very refined way to share what he considered some of the beauties of the Kabbalistic tradition of the Jewish mystical tradition to new generations, 
both those that were learned and those that were not yet a part of that circle of mystical teaching and learning. So let's turn to the text, because I think it's um, a beauty. And as you would expect, it is on Parshat Bereshit. It's on this week's Torah portion. And um, it deals with the subject of tradition and innovation. I'm gonna ask my mom to unmute herself and read the beginning of this text and I'll pause and offer commentary. And if time allows, um, we'll engage in some conversation together. So Ima, if you would, the text from the Dega Machane Ephraim, beginning with the quotation from Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the descendants of Adam. Let us begin with what I've taught elsewhere about the verse, quote, Moses diligently sought out the goat for the sin offering. Tradition notes that the words diligently sought are the midpoint in a letter count of the Torah. What does that suggest? We know that the written Torah and the oral Torah are, are truly one. They cannot be separated from each other. Indeed, neither is it possible, neither is possible without the other, since the written Torah reveals its secrets through oral interpretation. The written Torah was like half a book until the sages came and interpreted it, illuminating our eyes and revealing hidden secrets. Sometimes they would even uproot something from the Torah, as was the case regarding punishment by lashes. The sages reduced the number by one, based on Deuteronomy 23.5. They did all this by means of their connection to their Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodeshim, which was manifest to them and gave this, them this power. The wholeness of the written Torah is thus dependent on the oral Torah. Thank you. So this is the first half of the teaching. And like many Hasidic teachings, it starts with a kind of hopscotching between biblical and rabbinic verses, some of which he assumed were well known to his audience and others were new. And those that were old, he sought to make new as a preacher. So here are some of the elements that I want to emphasize to you. This expression darosh darash is one that is well worn in rabbinic commentary because it points linguistically to this notion of seeking out as in the word midrash, lidrosh, midrash, to comment, to seek out, to try and elucidate, interpret, etc. Darosh darash and as someone discovered or invented. <laughs> it is exactly midway. It sits at the heart of the Torah. And the message from the heart of the Torah is darosh darash. Seek out diligently. The context of the pshat, right, as it relates to an offering, an animal offering, doesn't matter to the rabbis in later generations because they understand this as a coded message, which is to say, in the time of Moses in the wilderness, right, the great mode of avodah, of devotion, of service, was through animal sacrifice. But in subsequent generations, right, in the spirit of diligently seek, Judaism had to evolve. And so there became new forms, tefillah, right, verbal prayer, and limud Torah, the study of Torah were two of the most significant. So darosh darash is at the heart of Torah. If that is the case, says the Degel Machane Ephraim in a very bold way, then the written Torah, that is the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, scriptures, the canon, is but one half of the Torah. The other half is oral Torah. Torah Shebichtav is the written Torah. Torah Shebaal Peh is the oral Torah. And he, like many generations before him, insisted that you can't have one without the other. And of course, there have been controversies throughout Jewish history, like, for example, the Karaites, right, and the Rabbinites, discussing how to interpret Torah and what is considered to be authentic 
and authoritative interpretation. And here, the message of this sage is all of these generations later, after Sinai, after the close of the Tanakh, after the rabbis of the Talmud, after the great philosophers and mystics of the medieval period, lo and behold, we still are commanded with darosh darash. You must continue to turn it and turn it again. And the emphasis here is on the interplay between Torah Shebichtav and Torah Shebaalpeh. Now, one of the interesting things that he's going to do is ask rhetorically about the secrets, because he comes from a mystical tradition in which Kabbalah is understood as the esoteric inner chamber of the interpretive palace of interpretation. So he's interested in the multiple meanings that are present in every letter, word, and phrase. So if, for example, from the letter bet, as Sharon said, you can derive many meanings, and from the expression darosh darash, you can find many meanings, what is he going to do with our verse? With this is the book of the descendants of Adam. You'll see what he's going to do you know, in his play momentarily. He says quite clearly in the spirit of mystics that the ability to interpret and to interpret meaningfully in one's time and place is in fact an extension of the prophetic spirit. It's called Ruach HaKodesh. And that he insists is available still to the leaders at least of the generations. After all, remember Hasidism was based on the belief in the charismatic power of mystical masters. And so this is a statement about the act of interpretation, but it's also a statement, historically speaking, about the power of Hasidism, of this new upstart movement of mystical masters that insist that they have something new or renewed, better put, to share with people. And that it has to do with this creative impulse to discover divinity in new or renewed ways, in unexpected ways. And so he's insisting that new and fresh interpretations appropriate for this particular time and place are available. And in fact, he will say that if one denies this, they are heretical. You can't tear apart Torah Shebichtav and Torah Sheba'al Peh. Because if you try to do that, you are left fragmented. And the search is for a kind of wholeness. Because if we take seriously one of the watchwords of Kabbalah, the Hasidim tried to embody, late atar panui mine, an Aramaic expression which says, there is no ploy, place devoid of the divine then there are always new and different possibilities of creative expression, of nitzotzot. So this is the first part of the teaching. Here's the second part of the teaching. Marty, would you read it for us? Yes, I'd be glad to. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> this is what the words diligently sought Darosh Darash imply. The words of the written Torah <clears throat> were only half of the letters of the Torah, that is, until the sages interpreted them. Only then was it a whole book. Hence the emphatic words, Darosh Darash Nidrash. So it is with each generation and its interpreters. They make the Torah whole. Torah is interpreted in each generation according to the particular needs and soul roots of that generation. God illumines the eyes of each generation's sages to interpret his holy Torah 
And one who denies this is like one who denies Torah, perish the thought. It is well known that King David is the secret of oral Torah, as the monarch is associated with God's indwelling presence, the Shekhinah, and sacred speech. It is also written that David was originally fated to perish in utero. Applying these teachings, we can now explain the verse. This is, oh, however, however, Adam gifted him with 70 years from his own lifespan, and so King David was born. Applying these teachings, we can now explain the verse, this is the book of the descendants of Abraham, of Adam. This is the book, refers to the written Torah, which was made whole through the descendants of Adam, that is, through King David, the secret of oral Torah. David was truly Adam's descendant. Thank you. So now that he's introduced the principle, generally speaking, the klal, with one or two interesting exegetical moves, <laughs> he takes his flight of fancy, right, higher, deeper, and doubles down. And so I want to look at a few particular phrases, the particular needs and soul roots of that generation. It was understood as one of the discerning responsibilities of the Hasidic masters to ask themselves as mystics, what does this generation need? What is the Torah for this time and place? And so one had to think about the spiritual roots of that particular generation. How is it similar or different from past generations? And you can imagine as the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, he was also asking himself that question in a personal way. It would be easy to be overwhelmed by the legend of this figure whom he actually knew and lived with until the age of 12. So what is my calling? What is ours to do? What does my generation need that is similar or different from past generations, including even in this second or third generation of this new spiritual movement? How do I carry that on authentically in my own particular way? Not like my grandfather necessarily, not like my brother necessarily, not like my nephew necessarily, right? But how do I do it? And then he says something interesting, that according to Kabbalah, the inherited traditions of Jewish mysticism, King David is understood as a symbol or as embodying the characteristic of the Shekhinah, the indwelling often understood as the female or feminine presence of the divine in this world, who is associated with the mouth as the conduit of all the great secrets that come through the chain of being known as the Sfirot. And her mouth opens, or we are to give voice to that Torah if we listen and discern, if we are attuned to the divine murmuring, you might say. And of course, too, the Kabbalists were not shy or coy when it came to erotic imagery. So the mouth is also right, a symbol related to the vagina and to the uterus and to the life-giving power of Torah. And then from there, we go to this Midrash. You see the associations here about King David, whose lifespan, say the rabbis, was supposed to be a thousand years, but he only lived, Nebuch, 930 years. And the reason for that is because he gifted Adam, who he understood, right, in a kind of prophetic manner, was to die in utero. So Adam was supposed to live a thousand years. King David was supposed to die in utero. Adam bequeaths to King David 70 years of life. 70 years, of course, relates to the fullness of the interpretive possibilities, right? It's one of those numbers that the rabbis love, as in Shivim Panim La Torah, 70 faces or expressions of Torah. 
David is malchut, David is kingship, David is shechina, the indwelling presence of the divine. David is the one that understands how to give articulation to all that has come before it, because among other things, David is the great poet, David is the great musician, David is, right, a new and different kind of model. Understood, of course, selectively, right, romantically, through the eyes of mystics throughout the generations. So what does it mean ultimately that David is the descendant of Adam? Well, here is a summary as I understand this piece in this limited time. Written Torah, right, constitutes half the Torah. Oral Torah is the other half. And it is not only the imperative, but the responsibility of Torah scholars in every generation to deny right, the life-giving power of this interpretive process is to commit heresy. And sages in every generation have to discern what are the needs and the nature of that generation. Darosh, darash, right? We have to look at every letter, word, phrase, sentence, and ask ourselves, how could this be a source of meaning here and now? using the building blocks, of course, of the past, but seeking to answer that question in our context. So what does it mean, this is the book of the descendants of Adam? Adam, right, the primordial person who represents the primordial wisdom of the fullness of God's chokhmah or wisdom, Torah in its totality, gives birth to generations, one after the next, who, if they are like King David, have the courage and the poetic sensibility to offer new and different meanings. So that is what it means, ultimately, to be among the generations. We, too, are like King David, the offspring, because we're giving voice to Shekhinah, which is ever-present, but that is awaiting our intimate engagement with her in this process.